Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Wrath of the Titans movie thoughts. So, this film did not deal with what the previous one left behind, sort of the ongoing issue of humans are starting to abandon their belief in the gods and that has consequences. You know, in the first one that was sort of established. But I guess in the first one it was sort of just, it was, it was personified. And in this one it's made a bit more general, I guess. You know, it's sort of bad things will happen when the gods lose their power, even if it's not, you know, gods causing it. So... Yeah, by the end of the film, humans still don't believe more in the gods, you know, so yeah, they, they, they didn't really address that at all. I mean, I get that there's this sort of thing going on with, oh, we have to take responsibility and, you know, we can't put all our faith in things that we don't understand and, you know, yeah, responsibility and all that. And I'm glad, but they also keep having the villain arise from man's losing faith in the gods. So that's something they really need to address. If they ever make a third one, which I don't really think they should, and I'm going to explain why. Yeah, they, they really do need to address that. Yeah, what, what, what do we do with that? I'm not saying that necessarily it ends with you know, man just having faith in the gods again, but there needs to be some kind of solution. You know, plus, in both of these films, Perseus only defeats the, you know, whatever was released by less faith in the gods because of the gods, you know. I'm trying to avoid spoilers for the first one here, but in this one, it's the... Trium Spear, the Spear of Trium, something like that, you know, you know, collect all three and, you know, yeah, so <laughs> what would you have done if the, you know, if, if there was absolutely no power left in the gods? Now, why no third film? If, or at least if they do, not more sequels. I think it's, I don't know, prequel, spin-off, something like that, maybe. But, Zeus is gone. He, he died, you know. He said outright, Hades already gave me a last chance. Nope, this time I'm dying. Ares, also dead. <laughs> Poseidon, yeah, dead as well, but he didn't really matter that much. Why, why you even cast Danny Houston in that role if he's not going to turn out to be a villain? You know, that is just counterintuitive casting right there, you know. Now, without Zeus, without the sort of... I don't even remember if the first film had something interesting between Zeus and Hades particularly, but this one very much does. You know, I don't completely buy that suddenly Zeus is forgiving Hades and Hades is helping to free Zeus. But once they got past that, Hades... I guess Ares just forgot about Hades once Zeus left Tartarus, you know, because suddenly Hades is just there in front of Zeus and it's like, hi, bro, you know, your son forgot about me, I don't know. I guess he didn't figure that one of the only remaining gods might have some kind of power to help defeat him. No, I don't know what he was doing that got him that preoccupied. He didn't seem to be really doing anything. I don't know, maybe he was just that distracted by Perseus praying to him. That was kind of clever, by the way. That was a nice little thing in the script. I, that worked, because you had that thing of, you know, they, they hear your prayers, and they can find you once the, you know, so you have that, that really worked, you know. 
I mean, you, you gotta have... It's the action movie cliche, you know? The good guy calls the bad guy, you know, let's meet up. And, yeah. So, anyway. Once Hades was, was there, and like, you know, I do really forgive you, and he brings him back to life. And it's that sort of thing of... You know, for a second there, I was wondering, how did he, how did he do that? But then it's like, right, the god of death. So he can, you know counteract the death. Yeah, whatever, just run with it. This is a different world, you know, if he's god of death, presumably he can mess around with death. So, then they're suddenly, you know, both standing there and they're like, well, we don't have any weapons. Eh, we, did. we had powers before we had weapons. Let's go out and have fun, like in the good old days, like when we were young, you know. And they're just taking out these, you know, twin torso things you know, without any issue. That was really cool, you know, spear and using, I don't know, telekinetic wind and death powers, I guess. Is it just me, or are telekinetic death powers a lot like just, you know, smoke, dark smoke? And then the very end with, of, of that entire thing, with both of them are attacked by Kronos. You know, you they, they give Perseus his opening, because how else would he, you know, manage to approach Kronos? So you have that sort of thing, because Kronos is extremely powerful. Perseus is only a demigod, and he's about to face a giant, you know, person made of lava. So, yeah, he's gonna need a little bit of help. So they distract him, Kronos attacks them, Perseus gets his opening, and we know he wins, you know. Love when he flies down the mouth and throat of the thing, you know. And again, you just feel like, you know, my, my friend compared it to, to, like, a carnival ride, you know. That was perfect. And, yeah, delivering the glowing spear of Ipecac. Perfect, you know. That was a really exciting sequence. And I think that there was an appropriate amount of time spent building up. Excuse me, you know, he was extremely powerful and he was destroying a lot of things. And just by, you know, just those twin torso things that he threw out were causing a lot of mayhem. So, yeah, you know, he was dangerous. He had to be put down. And I guess by the end of the... That's another thing with, you know, no faith in the gods... By the end, I mean, wasn't that what happened to him last time that he was defeated by the spear? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't thrown down his throat. Maybe last time he didn't go splody. Maybe last time they just used it to subdue him and then they put him in the, you know, Tartarus jail cell. Which makes me wonder why they didn't use it, you know, to completely kill him before. But whatever. If he isn't dead... Yeah, they're gonna need to rebuild the Tartarus jail cells, like, you know, Zeus was talking about in the beginning of the movie. So, yeah. Now, yes, the moments between Hades and Zeus. You know, with Kronos attacking them, and Zeus throws Hades to the ground, and thus saves him. You know, so you have that sort of, maybe it's partially the, the guilt, but you know, it might help him redeem himself with Hades, you know, it is a, it's, it's a good gesture, you know, it's, and, it, well, more than a, just a good gesture, it's, you know, because it really does kill him, and he knew it would, so you have this great sacrifice, you know, that's the kind of thing, I don't think there are enough of those left in, in movies nowadays. I think sometimes it's just the, the useless kind of sacrifice, because, eh, a sacrifice, that's good, you know. I don't know, it works for the Christians. And sometimes it's just, yeah, I, I don't know, yeah, other times there's just no sacrifice. And it's just, it's a nice, good, heroic gesture, you know. So, and in this one, it really worked. You know, and I think that's the perfect way to... If, if you're gonna kill off Zeus, that's a great way to do it. You know, and... Yeah, I, I just love the... This situation with them. You know, I think that was a really... Some, some really interesting character drama. And, in spite of Ares not being... 
all that cool from just, I don't know, when he fought, he was kind of cool. But just looking at him, I don't know, a little bit emo, a little bit metro, not terribly interesting. But the, again, the character drama, you know, this, he betrays his father because he's not the favorite son. You know, again, sort of, like I said in the review, soap opera, maybe some Shakespeare, something like that. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, and it's actually... I don't know, comes from the first movie. Yeah, I guess, you know, with in the first movie, it was established that Zeus really did care about Perseus and that there was this sort of animosity between him and Hades, you know, that also comes from the first movie. So I like that they build on that, as well as building on this, you know, their man has no faith in the gods anymore. You know, what does that lead to? I think that the scene where Hephaestus has to open, you know, he opens the door and then they get attacked. And, you know, or maybe it was there. Anyway, he opens the door, they're attacked, and we have this door that is going to close. You know, there's no way that, you know, they only have a few seconds and then, you know, they have to try their hand at defeating Ares, you know, with the frickin' Warhammer, which again, very nicely was established. You know, you have, you know, you see it take out Zeus. You see it take out a god, and suddenly he's going to be using it against mortals. So, you know that, you know, some bad stuff's going to go down. And, yeah, you know, you have that sort of ticking clock. You have to get to this point. You know, from this point to this point in the allotted time, you have to get, you know, this door is going to close. That's a... An absolutely ancient action movie cliche, but it works in this film, you know, and it works in other films, of course. You know, it's a cliche for a reason, but they really make it work, you know. It it was a really exciting sequence with all of them trying to take out Ares and, uh, yeah, the whole thing, that was really cool. I like that they didn't defeat the Cyclops, uh, Cyclops sees something that it was, you know, the, the elder... Did anybody else notice that apparently all of these Cyclopses were male? <sighs> I'm glad I'm not a Cyclops. <sighs> no offense to homosexual Cyclopses. But yeah, you know, it was the elder Cyclops that sort of noticed that's of the gods. Clearly you're on their side. Or you killed one of them. Either way, I'm gonna help you. You know, that you have that sort of thing that, you know, the, the battle is not always the answer. And to be fair, the Cyclops is struck first. But yeah, you know, you have that sort of thing. And it was also, it was mildly amusing when, you know, he was trapped and the, the Agonaut, or it was trapped. And he's like, don't cut the rope. No, he's right. It's the foal would kill him. Cut the rope, you know. That was a little... I, I'm not entirely sure what it was that made the trap completely... I don't know, I guess it's just one of those things, you know. He says he didn't do anything, but... Yeah. What else was there? Perseus flying towards Kronos was a perfect use of 3D and really great, you know, it really captured the perspective. I like that this film didn't always feel the need to be close up or the need to cut really quickly. Sometimes you just show something and by the sheer magnitude of what is going on or the sheer contrast, it is impressive. Yeah, another thing in this film is the Cyclops walking, and then you see the, the people walking between them, you know, when they're going to Hephaestus, you know. But yeah, Kronos flying, you know, Perseus flying towards Kronos with just this huge magma figure, and this tiny little, you know, black flying horse, and the man on top of it with the glowing, you know, weapon. That really showed just how, 
you know, huge. I, I felt it was much more effective than the Kraken. And I think part of it is just the, you know, the camera had a bit, you know, the camera lingered a bit in this one, where in the other, and I think it maybe cut a bit faster. I don't remember the first one much at all, I gotta say. One thing that did not work, there were a couple of things in the maze of Tartars that did not work. For one thing, this idea that they were, you know, their minds were being messed with because, yeah, you know, that really didn't work. I, there, there, excuse me, there were maybe two, three moments where they even tried to do it at all. You know, most of it, it just, if you'd cut the line about how they were going to be, you know, there'd be purists, are, you know, attacking the film for it, sure. But if you cut the line saying that it would happen, and then you cut those couple of instances, you would not miss them in the film. And that's really <laughs> the sign of something that needs to go, you know. It just didn't work. I don't think there was room in the film for it because of the pace and the decidedly action-adventure genre, you know, it just... You need to actually spend some time with something like that. You know, it's it's a more horror-thriller element, and... Yeah, you know... I, I hate to give Event Horizon props for anything, but... At... You know, at this moment, that's the movie I can think of where, you know, that sort of worked. You know, you have this sort of thing where someone is following something they think is, you know, someone they love, and bad things happen from it. I think part of what they, what should have been, is that four people should have been in that maze. Not only the three that we know have to survive. Four, and that last one, is lured away by something like that. You know, that there is that... You know, maybe it should have been the chick who turned out to be a, an Ares GPS, you know, because she went ahead and prayed to him anyway, you know. That was a nice moment as well. You know, you you always have to have that sort of thing where, oh, the, the bad guy won't find us here. <gasps> he found us how? You know, and that was a pretty good, <coughs> excuse me, explanation for it. But, but yeah, you know, if you had a fourth person in there, and that person saw something that had been established as being something they cared about, and is almost messing it up for the other three, that would have been great. But instead, you just have, you know, Andromeda is like, isn't that the Ares praying chick? I thought she was dead, and she's, you know, starting to move there, and, you know, Agonaut is like, nope, and she's like, okay, and that's it. You know, and then you have Perseus a couple of times with, is that Helios? And, you know, he runs after him. And, you know, even when he's killing the Minotaur, who has far too little screen time, you know, it's it's nicely designed. It's, it's a hideous thing, you know, with the bodily fluids on its face and everything, you know, and the horns. It was a great design, but they spent far too little time on it. The fight was far too brief. But, but yeah, you know, when he's killing it, it's like, oh, don't kill me, daddy. That really didn't work. I, I think I get what they were going for, you know, that that was supposed to, like, slow him down and sort of, I don't know. I don't know exactly what they should have done, but what they did just did not work. And with the Minotaur fight, you know, is it just me? Or it, it like, it tries to, you know, use his, its horns to attack him, you know. And the horns get stuck in, a, you know, the rock bed or whatever it's called. And, no Flintstone jokes, please. And instead of, I don't know, being relieved that it's now stuck, he helps break its horns off. I guess he wanted more of a 
fight with it, that moment should have played out entirely differently. I think it would have been great if Perseus had been like, you know, drawing his sword and he's about to decapitate it or something, and then it itself breaks off the horns and he maybe like chops and misses and then it attacks him or something. But him breaking off the horns, I don't know, I you know, honor amongst warriors, I guess. But yeah, that, that just really didn't work. And it was also just kind of too easily defeated, you know, like I already said, it was not in the film for long enough. But it is, I would say, the only creature that is not in the film for long enough, you know. You have, you know, the, the twin torso guys who take out a good chunk of the army and really establish that Kronos is a massive, you know, is extremely destructive and very, very dangerous. You know, he's... He has sort of the presence of a tidal wave, so you need, you know, in this kind of film, you need something more concrete, you know, because he's sort of just approaching the encampment, the city, whatever, and that's not gonna keep our attention for long enough in this kind of film. So he hurls out these, you know, warriors of his, and they are just taking out a ton of you know, soldiers, you know, not just regular people, but soldiers, and, yeah, so there's those, there's the twin-headed wolf thing with fire breath, there's the, there are the cyclops, this, you know, even the gods, you know, everyone who fights in this film, well, maybe, except for maybe Poseidon, but everyone else who fights gets to do something really cool and gets enough screen time to really, you know, I thought they did really well on that. I suppose that more or less... Well, that very last... Near the very end of the film. Well, the, the end of the film. Right after, you know, Perseus suddenly realizes, hey, there's a romance subplot in this script. Maybe we should, you know, actually address that. So he goes and kisses Andromeda, who's probably, you know, immediately after they cut... She was probably, like, shoving him away and going, like, what are you doing? We haven't had a single, even slightly, you know, together e moment since this film started. So, what is what is this, you know? Okay, she, she appreciates his skill as a strategist or a warrior, but that's kind of it, you know? What is... They're, they're the two, you know, male and female leads, and so they should necessarily mate, is that it? Anyway, after that, he goes to Helios, and, you know, he's, you know, like, well, kid, you're kind of a wimp. I, I suspect you were actually cast simply because, you, you know, you're really good at looking very scared all the time. So, want to have a sword? And, you know, he's like, hey, this, Dad, this sword is heavier than I am. And so he's like, oh, but can you handle it? Yes. And the end. So I guess, well, okay, how it works, I guess, is the sort of generational thing. That you have this sort of, you know, Zeus gave to Perseus and Perseus is now giving to Helios. And that, I guess, works. But other than that, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, the kid's only like a quarter of a god, I guess. So... Wait, was I a god? Anyway, would that make him three quarters god? Then Any, anyway, yeah, I I don't know. Is is the kid going to pick up the you know this trade as well and be you know the the next warrior in this kind of thing that. I don't know, I, I guess maybe in Greek mythology, which I don't remember too much of, frankly, he might be, but I don't know, I just don't see it as a sort of thing. It, it didn't really occur to me that the film was supposed to be about that, you know, at the end of it you need to have, you know, you need to pass it along to your offspring that, you know, you have to fight and this sort of thing. I, I don't know, it just, 
Yeah, again, what I gather from these films is if you're not at least halfway God, <laughs> you're not going to save the world. That's that's just how it is, you know. That's this is ancient Greece, buddy. Half God or get out. I suppose that pretty well covers it. I was glad that Perseus, whilst slightly more Australian, was also less brooding in this film because that got old in the first film fast. You know, the whole tortured hero thing. He was downright emo in the first film. That was really painful. And in this, much much better. You know, in this one essentially he doesn't have personality and you know, he he's just he's there so that the sword won't, you know, just move by itself in the air and so that there's someone to ride atop Pegasus, but yeah, you know, he doesn't have much of a excuse me, presence other than that. Yeah, I suppose that is it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.